Good morning, everybody. Uh, Rob Bailey, I'm the CEO of DataSift. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at, at RMB. Um, as it turns out, I think we're actually competing against one of our board members, Mark Suster, uh, who is presenting in the main room. Um, and so uh, it's a bit thin out there. So we're going to try to make it as interesting as possible for the four of you that are out there um, and uh, tear through a bunch of uh, social stuff really quickly. Um, before I get started, how many people here have heard of DataSift? Great. Okay, that's good. So most of the four people that are here have heard of DataSift. That's great. Um, and uh, obviously, uh, Mark I Suster in the main room is going to be talking a little bit about us as well. Um, so obviously, today's uh, or this this conference is about the sharing economy. So today's uh, presentation is going to be really about what that means for uh, what that means for social. So. So welcome to the sharing revolution. How many people here are using Twitter on a regular basis? Great. Uh, and Facebook, I'm guessing the same. Pinterest, some of the hands start to go down. Uh, LinkedIn, I'm guessing quite a bit. Yes, yeah, so the amount of time people are spending on social networks is obviously exploding, as is the amount of content that's being shared across the different social networks. Um, I remember in the past few years still hearing companies talking about social and whether or not maybe it was a fad that was going to come and go. And I said, sort of, yeah, sure, um, just like the internet's a fad as well. Um, uh, I've, I'm constantly amazed with the amount of time people are spending on social networks, the value they're getting from them. Um, I think Mark Zuckerberg coined the rule that the amount of data that people are sharing on social networks is doubling every year. Um, which sounded pretty dramatic, uh, but seems to really be the case. Uh, we're working with social networks uh, that are just growing explosively. Some great examples are uh, Twitter, for example. When we first started working with them, they were uh, generating 50 million tweets per day. A few years later, uh, Twitter's uh, producing four to 500 million tweets a day. So just an absolutely massive uh, amount of growth. Um, and then what that really means is, is the sharing continues across all the social networks. It's a huge amount of data. So it's really, uh, social networks really provide what we would call sort of the perfect storm of data, which is it's massive, it's real time, and probably most importantly, it's unstructured. How many people here know about the term unstructured data? Great, okay. Well, you're gonna make this really easy for me. Uh, unstructured data is uh, a lot harder to work with uh, but at the same time can yield a lot more interesting conclusions. And what this is really about is we're finding for companies, uh, in the past, the data that people use to make decisions in companies of all kinds was really more about um, you know, structured data and relational databases, sales, customers, orders, et cetera, ERP systems, um, where we're really seeing the huge growth uh, for uh, how decisions are made in companies is really around unstructured data, which for the most part tends to be uh, external data to companies. Um, this data is obviously hard to work with. Um, it can contain all different kinds of um, material, can contain links, uh, which means that the processing that you have to do on it is incredibly complicated. You have to do um, natural language processing of all kinds, language detection, gender detection, and then you overlay a bunch of other uh, rich information as well. Uh, who can guess uh, how many fields of metadata a typical tweet has? Anybody? I'm trying to make this interactive here, I know the room's hot. Um, so when we receive a tweet from Twitter, it'll sometimes have as much as 60 to 70 fields of metadata. Uh, see if you guys can guess how many fields of metadata a typical tweet has when we're done with it and do all the additional processing. Our chief product officer. <laughs> yeah, so just imagine the size of this big data problem, which is you have a massive volume of data and a huge amount of metadata around it. Um, so this really creates a bunch of uh, very important challenges, extracting the information from the data, uh, information overload, and then uh, another really important challenge is 
if in the past you're dealing with relational databases and things like orders and revenue that were actually in systems, you're now dealing with data that is being created outside of the company. And a big part of what you have to do is actually integrate this data from social networks with data from uh, within your company. Um, so let's see if you guys, before I go to the next slide, um, have you guys, I'm sure all of you have started to see how social is starting to interact uh, with companies and how companies are trying to integrate social data in with some of their decision making. Uh, what are some of the areas that you guys have seen social data starting to be used within big companies? Anybody? Very quiet out there. I'm going to ask them to turn up the air conditioning. Um, well, so here you go. Uh, here are just some of the areas where we're seeing the biggest opportunities. Uh, so customer insights, market intelligence, uh, strategic analysis, and probably one of the uh, most common ones that I interact with, which is customer care. Uh, have any of you out there uh, interacted with a brand or maybe a hotel chain or an airline uh, using social networks? Anybody? How was it? Was it a good experience? Yeah, I'm getting a little bit of the more or less, not so good. Uh, how, so of the people that have interacted with brands, uh, how many people have seen brands react to them 100% of the time? Maybe 50% of the time? Yeah, that's, that's kind of about right uh, for what we're seeing in the industry, which is about 50% of the time. Just imagine if you called your credit card company, you called your airline, and 50% of the time, they didn't answer the phone. It's terrible. And this is exactly what's happening in customer service. Um, I had a fascinating conversation with uh, the chief technology officer of American Airlines. How many people here fly American Airlines? Anybody? OK, one person. Yeah, I used to fly American Airlines a lot, but their customer service is pretty terrible. So I stopped flying them. And I now fly mostly United and Virgin, uh, Virgin Atlantic and Virgin America. Virgin America, by the way, amazing customer service and social. Um, so I was talking to the chief technology officer of American Airlines, and I asked her, you know, hey, so you know, I used to fly you guys, but you never responded to my tweets. You know, what's going on? Was it something I said? Is it something personal? And she said, you know, there's just so many tweets that it's just too overwhelming. We've decided to not respond to them. And I thought, my gosh, you know, I mean, just imagine if they were saying this about uh, phone calls. Oh, you know, there's too many phone calls. We've just decided not to answer them. So um, frustrating as a customer. Uh, but for all of you out there that are entrepreneurs, it presents an amazing opportunity. And we're actually going to be hearing later from a company called Conversocial that has really viewed this as uh, an awesome opportunity. So talk a little bit about what Datasift does. Uh, we basically filter thousands of these data sources uh, and make it really easy to work with social data. Uh, or put another way, we do a lot of the really ugly, heavy lifting um, in terms of the platform work around working with social data, which means that um, amazing companies can be built quickly uh, using social data without having to spend millions of dollars on infrastructure. Uh, one of the companies that um, is going to be presenting uh, as part of our presentation this morning uh, just recently raised a round, and we were talking about how great it was that he didn't have to spend, of the money he did raise, he didn't have to spend a few million of it hiring engineers and buying rack space uh, to process uh, big data from social. And he could really just focus his resources on continuing to build out uh, the amazing application that they've already built. So here's kind of a quick overview about us. Uh, when, I, when we launched in just November of 2011, we were at 20. We're up to 80. Uh, so growing really fast. We've raised about 30 million, uh, tons of customers. Here's what we do. And I'm just going to step through this really quickly because you can read it. We'll also be posting this on SlideShare later. But we basically take the huge mess of social data created on the social networks. We ingest it. Uh, we aggregate it all together across all the different sources. We have a unified schema that we use to unify data across all these different sources so you can work with them more easily. We enrich it. As Tim Barker mentioned earlier, we take the sort of sometimes 70 fields of metadata around a particular social item um, and enrich the hell out of it uh, so you can get up to four or 500 fields of metadata. Um, we then filter, tag it, uh, and deliver it intelligently in a variety of different systems. This means that whether it's a big brand or a tech company can use social data in a lot of ways and really focus on using the data and creating insights from it um, rather than uh, having to buy rack space. So 
Oh yeah, and we do all of that in about half a second. Um, so sometimes people ask, you know, hey, are you like uh, Radiant 6 or a Sysmos or a company like that? And the answer is uh, absolutely not. Uh, we are not an application company. We are a platform company. We take the data in from the social networks and then uh, process it and then power hundreds of applications. We've, this is the, uh, the big complicated slide. We'll, we actually have built an infrastructure that we think is so hard to build that we've actually published our infrastructure map online. Uh, you don't need to take pictures. We'll actually be posting this on SlideShare later. Uh, but this just gives you an idea of the complexity of our infrastructure. Uh, we're really proud of it. Um, and certainly with any of you that are uh, architecting for social, we're happy to go through it in more detail. Um, I've been uh, through this slide so many times, I sometimes see it in my sleep. Uh, but I think that the key lesson from this slide is we've invested millions and millions of dollars in the back end of uh, social data so that you don't have to. And you can just focus on building amazing applications. Um, we also deliver the social data in a variety of different applications around companies. Um, in the past, in the, what we would call social 1.0, social data was really being used by social media teams within the marketing organization. It was usually a bunch of hipsters over in the corner of a marketing department. Um, but what we're really seeing now is that social is actually infusing decision making all around the company. And that creates amazing opportunities for entrepreneurs to build companies or build um, new products and applications uh, for, that enable decision making throughout the companies. Uh, so we, we now work with hundreds of businesses uh, that are doing really interesting things. And I think that um, these are just obviously a few of the logos, but um, we've just been absolutely amazed with the variety of different, um, uh, of different uses of social. Uh, for example, we're seeing uh, social being used to do early detection on news. Um, Dell has done an amazing job. They were uh, previously working with the social media monitoring company. They actually built their own tool called the Social Net Advocacy Tool using DataSift. They did it in about two months. Um, and now every brand manager around the world at Dell has a customized dashboard that they can look at uh, that monitors social activity that is specific to their geographies and their brands. Um, some other interesting ones, uh, we have an agency on there that um, uh, has set up a bunch of very customized social monitoring for uh, Red Bull. Uh, Badgeville uses it as part of their reward system. Um, Goldman Sachs, another really interesting one. They're building a huge range of uh, different applications to identify um, early successful tech companies before they become public, uh, as well as positive and negative spikes on uh, publicly traded companies. CBS Interactive um, has uh, obviously owned CNET. How many people here uh, go to CNET? Okay, we see a few hands go up, great. So uh, they actually built an internal news monitoring platform called Hammer, which among other things enables them to detect uh, breaking news and uh, positive and negative sentiment around uh, tech products, which uh, provides very rich tools for reporters. Um, as I'm sure all of you have had the experience of reading a tech article where you know, a reporter writes about a particular trend that's happening, um, and sometimes it seems like maybe that trend's kind of made up and maybe isn't even really a trend. Um, so we're seeing uh, CBS Interactive with CNET and a lot of other companies as well are using social to actually reality check when they do things like, for example, uh, trends or breaking news stories. So these are just a few of the many companies that uh, we're actually working with um, in social. Uh, we are uh, honored and uh, constantly amazed with some of the cool uses that we're seeing for social activity uh, and how companies are using social to create value for their customers. Uh, and we're very lucky and honored to have three amazing companies uh, that are going to get up. They're all customers of DataSift. Um, and they're each going to take turns coming up. And uh, they're going to talk a little bit about their company, about how DataSift powers some of what they're doing, um, and demos. How many people here want to see demos? Good. All right. Lots of hands. Good. I told them that's what you guys would want to see, but I'm, you know, I'm glad that I was actually right. So um, we're going to have execs from these companies get up. So uh, Francesco is going to be first. So I'd like all of you a little, little applause. You know, let's get the blood flowing. Um, and Francesco is going to talk a little bit about uh, Face Group and uh, give you guys a quick demo. Great. So FACE, if you never heard of it, is a research agency. So we started as a 
research consultants who were founded in 2005, and then we started kind of like adding social media as one of the key ingredients of the research projects that we were running. And uh, as we started developing methodologies and projects for uh, running social media research, we realized that actually the tools that were on the market were not up to scratch for the kind of task that we were needed to perform in the marketing uh, and the market research space. So we started to develop our own in conjunction with clients like O2 Telefonica, for example, that has been an early uh, client of us in piloting this new technology. And finally, we released this platform that we are going to demo to you today that is a social media intelligence platform, which has a very simple objective, which is to try and disrupt the social media monitoring industry, which has remained pretty much the same over the past 10 years. Uh, and what I mean, uh, what I mean by uh, it's remain exactly the same is that it basically does keyword tracking. And uh, at the same time, in the past 10 years, not only the web has changed, but the way we use the web has changed, the way companies use the web has changed. So there's a lot more things that we can do. And now with awesome platforms like Datasift, we have so much control over rich data that we will be stupid not to use it in more complex way than just doing keyword tracking. So uh, what I'm going to show you now it's, if I can find my window, yes, there it is. Uh, it's basically a few um, key things that this platform does that are different from what everybody else does. So um, the first thing I want to um, start with is like, um, as I was saying, all companies do this bit on the left hand side, topics tracking. So tracking keywords and bringing back content and mention those keywords. What we found a massive opportunity is, um, in uh, was uh, tracking uh, conversation in social media, not just by the keywords that they contain, but by audiences and by content. So defining an audience such as the people that, for example, are following the New York Times online. And then pull back all the content that these people generate so that you can get an interesting map of the audience and see what they really are about, uh, regardless of what they're mentioning. So finding out what you don't know, you don't know, which is actually the real premise of big data and the biggest opportunity. Um, what we also did was, um, thanks to the uh, link resolution function on Datasift, uh, was uh, the ability to uh, track content by links. So whatever URL is published on social media, we can understand where it's pointing to. We can resolve any URL and we can look at what the actual uh, content is behind the shortener so that we can track where it spreads. So what you would do in this case would just set up a different kind of tracker, bring back content that contains the links that you're tracking. A recent study that we've done on this was uh, tracking how Gangnam Style spread as opposed to the Harlem Shake and mapping where the top 10 videos for each meme were traveling around the web, who were sharing them. And one of the things that we realized, for example, was that uh, influencers did not play at all a major role in spreading those memes. Actually, small communities were driving engagement around both memes, and only 1% of the Harlem Shake mentions were coming from influencers and were generated by influencers that were being retweeted. And only 5% were coming from influencers, in the case of Gangnam Style. And those are pretty staggering numbers for someone who works in, in, in marketing and in market research, because what we told every day is exactly the opposite. So um, some interesting discoveries to be made. Um, the second thing that we um, um, do when we look at an audience and how they behave is, for example, how they uh, behave online. So this is an audience that uh, has been extracted by the people that have been mentioning the horse meat scandal. And this shows you that the scandal is pretty much still global in terms of mentions. Because on the left hand side, you will have the hour of the day. And on the uh, x axis, you will have the days. And you can see that the conversations are evenly distributed throughout the 24 hours across the globe. There's not like one band that is empty. Um, but what we can also do is look at what people are mentioning. So if you, for example, extract an audience from the people that are mentioning the web, uh, you can look at what, what links are they sharing. And uh, as you can see, the links are basically being uh, kind of like sized based on how, much, how many times they've been shared online. Uh, a really useful way of using this is, for example, if you are a uh, live nation and you're kind of like planning to run a festival and you want to attract the audience of the people that like Rihanna, you might want to know what kind of like news articles they read and what blogs they read and what do they share because you might want to put your ads for your next festival exactly on those websites. So this kind of like helps you creating the media mix for where you're going to reach your audience because you can see what they're, what they're up to in terms of interest but also what sources they use to kind of like share what they're interested in. Um, the second thing that we do that is pretty different from all the other platforms is uh, the idea that um, we don't just count mentions of social media, but we're looking at uh, 
the way social media impacts audiences. So we don't just tell you how many tweets have you got or how many social media uh, kind of like posts have you got on Facebook or on Tumblr, but we tell you how many people have been reached by those uh, those piece of content. So, so that you can do pretty much uh, what we did, for example, for the horse meat scandal, which was uh, um, kind of like keeping the finger on the pulse of where the next crisis was going to explode and helping companies like Tesco and Sainsbury's to kind of like realize when the next big flame of conversation was going to explode by looking at the visibility of this conversation. Because if you only look at the number of conversation, you're going to be really squeezed in terms of like the, 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 the people that get uh, the, the post content, you're not going to really be able to understand who is actually being reached and when something is really important. For example, a good case was this joke on the, 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 the Grand National where someone during this kind of like horse race in London posted something that mentioned Tesco, but it was just a joke and he got a spike of like more than 6,000 mentions. But when you actually look at the visibility of the spike, he didn't get the reach that other news got during the scandal. So the exposure of Tesco in that case wasn't kind of like a crisis kind of exposure. It was just, as I was saying, a joke. So measuring visibility helps you understand when something is actually a crisis and when instead it's just a simple joke. Hey, Francesco, how, if I'm Tesco, how could I use this information to manage my PR team differently yeah. or spend my advertising differently? So a really good way of using visibility, for example, is uh, visibility is quite predictive of spikes in engagement. So when you have a spike on visibility, you know that the next day you're going to have a spike in engagement because most people have been exposed to it. So you can gear up your teams to react to what's coming up next. Like O2 uses this platform for their customer care as well. So they can see when something is about to spike up because visibility will predict where the next mass of people will engage. And we're starting to correlate the amount of engagement to the amount of visibility so that we can tell you exactly how many people you will need to be on the case when the next crisis happens. How many people here have bought meat at Tesco in the last year? Just curious, okay. Uh, and the last thing that I wanted to show you is um, um, what I call uh, nose to tail uh, indexing. You know, the new kind of like you see him wave in, in Britain, it's nose to, to tail eating, so you eat all the different bits of the animal. We do kind of the same with indexing social data. We don't just look at the content of conversation, we look at everything that happens around that conversation and we index it. One of the things that we index is the bio of the authors. So if, if for example, Tesco wants to know um, which kind of people have been talking about the horse meat scandal, and knowing that as a retailer, one of your main segments could be mums, you can just type in mums or mother or mom, and you can just extract a segment of that conversation and see what moms are saying about the horse meat scandal, because obviously that would be more interesting to you than just the general conversation going on. And, 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 and this is the key point of analyzing social data in a more scientific way, providing context so that you know what those conversations are really about, where are they coming from, and what is the agenda of the people that are mentioning those conversations. And so, so Francesca, sorry to interrupt, was this, so is it really moms that were driving a lot of the conversation around horse meat? It was uh, actually, if you look at the entire crisis, it was even in split with 50% uh, moms and 50% and dead, like 49 towards 51. Um, but if you look at specific phases, moms and dead engaged in different ways. And what was interesting was that moms were always much grumpier than deads in terms of <laughs> sentiment analysis, because we measure also the degrees of sentiment, not just whether something is positive or negative. We can tell you when something is very positive or very negative. And I've started to test this across multiple data sets. And actually, moms are generally angrier than dads. So uh, I don't know what he says about dads. So d dads are more OK with horse meat than moms are. Well, dads are generally more laid back. <laughs> okay. um, and finally, you can use this information too. For example, if you look at the Le Web conference, uh, Monsieur Le Web might be interested in knowing what's the breakdown of the people that have been engaging with the conference online. And this is a really simple breakdown that is based on uh, what people say in their bio and what are they say in the past. Like we build interest graph for people that mention things in social media so that we can then go back and see, okay, these people are part of this category. And as you can see, of the people that have been mentioning the web over the past uh, couple of days, we've got a bunch of entrepreneurs, developers, marketers, journalists. There's quite a lot of journalists for a conference, actually. And that would be me. Yeah, if I could, if I could just add here, uh, this is my first time at the web. Um, and when we were putting together our presentation uh, for, that I blew through in the first part of this, present, uh, first part of this meeting, um, I actually, we had a presentation which was a lot more focused on big companies, 
Um, but obviously after having spent time here yesterday and today and then looking at the tweets and who they were coming from, I saw that a much bigger portion of the audience at LeWeb and who was probably going to be in this presentation today were entrepreneurs. So I actually uh, did a lot of updating of my presentation to focus a lot more uh, on the audience, on entrepreneurs. So it's a way to really in real time see who the audience is and then tailor your content uh, accordingly. Great. Awesome. Thank you, Francesco. Should Are there any questions? Later? Any questions right now? Or should we move on to, uh, to the next one? Okay. Maybe the heat's kind of getting you guys. Okay, there we go. You have a clap. Right. Get the blood flowing a little bit. <laughs> okay, you want to maybe... Gonna move. Yeah, there we go. Sorry, you guys have to watch while I do the uh, PowerPoint. So, uh, second screen analytics. Uh, how many people here use uh, Twitter or other social networks while they're watching TV? I use it a lot. Um, I, I actually, for uh, quite a long time, cut cable. Uh, but if there's one thing that has gotten me to uh, actually do what they call in the United States appointment-based TV um, or must-see TV, it's really uh, the ability to interact socially. Um, around uh, different programs. Um, I actually am finding that sometimes when I'm watching the programs, at least 50% of the enjoyment I get is actually interacting with my friends socially on, um, on different programs. And I've even found cases uh, like when I'm working um, or I'm traveling as I was this weekend where I might miss a show and just actually watching the social activity around a particular program um, can be entertainment in and of itself. So uh, how many people here watch Game of Thrones? Yeah, did you guys watch the episode on Sunday? Yeah, pretty traumatic. So uh, I didn't get a chance to watch it because I was flying to the, uh, to the UK, but uh, wow, I was really amazed when I got off the plane. The first thing I did when I was walking to the customs line is I looked at my Twitter stream and it was like, you know, I mean, I thought that you know, some celebrity or political figure had been assassinated by how upset people were in my social stream, and really it was just a TV program. So um, the good news is that social networks are making live TV or live TV viewing a lot more exciting. Um, it's extremely important for TV networks, and because of that, it's extremely important for the social networks. Twitter in particular, Dick Costal has talked a lot about how important second screen activity is for um, uh, what they're doing. Um, and I think part of it is because they're making TV, live TV more relevant, and part of it is because billions are spent on TV advertising. Um, so uh, it's creating a really interesting area of opportunity. Recently, uh, Bluefin got bought by Twitter, um, and I think we're going to see a huge amount more activity in the coming years around sort of the intersection of social with TV viewing. So uh, I'd like to call up an exec from uh, Second Sync, and uh, he's going to walk you guys through a demo. So there we go. Keep the blood flowing. Thanks, guys. Um, my name is Andy Littledale. I'm Managing Director of uh, Second Sync. And uh, we're a Bristol-based tech startup that's uh, focused on a, well, our business is entirely focused on a new audience behavior, which is uh, kind of often described as social TV. Let me just load this thing up. Is that loading? Yeah, cool. Uh, so social TV is a bit of a uh, kind of a bullshitty but a catch-all term at the moment, a bit like Web 2.0, if you know what I mean. It kind of means a lot of things to, to, to different people, and it's kind of ill-defined. Uh, but the way that we like to think about it is the way that uh, social media has taken conversations around TV shows uh, outside the living room and onto the internet in, in massive volumes. Um, and those, social net those conversations happen on all social networks, but the most compelling insights are coming from Twitter. And, <coughs> excuse me. That's for three main reasons. The first is, uh, is the immediacy of the platform. People tend to tweet when they're engaged with something, and so by mapping engagement spikes to TV shows, you can tell something interesting to broadcasters and uh, advertisers. Uh, the second is the public nature of the data. It's a, it's a, it's a public platform, and its users treat it as a public platform, so we can interrogate it and pull out insights. That same is not true on, on other social networks. And the third is the tweet itself being 140 characters. Uh, is really amenable to being made into a metric. You can compare like with like. Um, so we have created a, a platform which maps tweets to TV shows. Uh, it's quite a, a technically sophisticated platform. And we use DataSift to access the firehose. Um, we 
we track everything in the UK which gets any kind of traction on, on Twitter, which is around about 35 channels, around about 1,000 programs a day. We, I think we average about a million tweets mapped to TV shows. Um, but that's just an average. On a single uh, episode of X Factor can pull in a million tweets. And we wrap up those insights in a dashboard product, which we sell to broadcasters, agencies, and production companies. So our clients include people like BBC, Channel 4, ITV, uh, Mediacom, and Shine, a big production company. Um, but I've been asked to talk today a little bit about the insights that can be pulled out of, of our products. So I'll just give you a, a kind of little kind of talk through what the kind of things you can pull out from it. So this is last night's TV. Um, slightly getting cut off. If, uh, oh, I just got a full screen mode. The, cool. That's nice one. Um, so you can see the the most tweeted out show on the UK from yesterday was uh, The Only Way is Mobs, which is, I don't know if any of you watched, it's kind of a, uh, it's a Towie in Marbella, basically, kind of highbrow stuff. Um, but um, if I zoom through to that. So you can see how we, we plot uh, tweets over time. Uh, you can see the broadcast window in the middle, and we start tracking half an hour before a show and half an hour afterwards. The tweets here below, uh, you can see the, analyst, the, the analy analysis sorry, that we, we put on top of the data. So the number of tweets, the number of unique users. Um, we've also done a deal with the guys who Kanto, who run the bar panel in the UK, so we can give some context to our social figures with the actual viewing figures themselves. So we can overlay the, barb, the overnight barb data to show the, the audience size itself. Uh, and that's in there not as a, uh, as a kind of competitor to any of the barb products out there, but purely to give context to social figures. Because what people are really interested in is that relationship between social and TV and what, how much you know, tweeting on, uh, you know, high volumes on Twitter kind of affect tuning. So uh, by kind of marrying the two data sources, we can uh, start to flesh out some of those kind of stories. Um, so you can see the ad breaks and, uh, and that kind of stuff. And you can see the audience progressively grow over time, uh, which, you know, kind of anecdotally, which is something that you don't see on uh, programs which aren't so kind of um, socially active. So... You know, anecdotally, uh, there is quite a lot of ev evidence to suggest that kind of high vol volumes on Twitter kind of leads to, to increased tuning. Um, you can do things like uh, reorder by number of tweets and followers. So you can see Joey Essex was the guy with the most followers who retweeted around this. Gary Lineker had the most retweets. And that's kind of just, you know, anecdotally interesting stuff. But what we're really focused on is... Uh, the kind of insights where you can make kind of core business decisions. Um, so an example of this is uh, the Twitter client monitoring that we, we perform. So you can see here, uh, last night, 58% like 50, of all tweets around this show were sent from iPhones, which is kind of a, a disproportionately high number considering the distribution of uh, handsets. Uh, but we, we frequently see that on uh, entertainment shows. And Channel 4 used that information. At the time when they signed up for us, they didn't support iOS devices for their video. Uh, it was all streamed in Flash, and obviously Flash didn't support iOS. When they saw the stats coming out of our platform, they changed that to start delivering uh, stuff which worked on iOS devices. So that's just kind of one, in, one little insight into the kind of things our, our customers are doing with the data. Andy, I was, I was surprised, you know, coming from the U.S., I was surprised, we were talking about this earlier, I was surprised to see BlackBerry was number two beating out Android. Yeah, I mean... talk about that for a moment? Yeah, no, sure. I mean, we do, we frequently see kind of uh, strange... <laughs> kind of BlackBerry cropping up in strange places. We did a bunch of tracking around um, the FA Cup, and actually BlackBerry was the top uh, Twitter client around the FA Cup. Um, and I think, you know, it has a kind of younger demographic in the UK than it does in the States. Um, but it's, I mean, it's interesting data, and it's kind of it's stuff which our clients can make decisions about, but I won't pretend to understand completely <laughs> why uh, BlackBerry is used more than anything else when you're watching FA Cup games. Um, but it's, you know, it's interesting. But, and if you compare uh, those kind of Twitter clients to something like uh, Question Time. How many people here watch Question Time? Just let that load. So this is the series view of Question Time over the last, well, since January the 1st this year. Um, so I'll go to the kind of highest hitting one, which was here. And if you look at the Twitter clients, so Twitter.com for desktop was the, the, the top client there, followed by iPhone, Android, and BlackBerry's way down there uh, at 4%. Um, 
so this is a kind of older demographic tweeting uh, with their laptops on their on their on their laps, pretty much. Um, and yeah, I'll overlay the bulb stuff so you can see that's different. That's a typical picture for for this show. What does that mean? That means that the the audience is dropping off throughout it. Um, <laughs> so it's so people tune in and then it's, it's on quite late at night and people tend to drop. People off. People start to fall asleep. Yeah, exactly. Got it. Okay. Um, but another very interesting thing that people have done with our data is, uh, is Red B. Uh, if I go to Africa, how many people saw the BBC Africa series, which went out at the beginning of the year? Um, it did pretty well in, the, in terms of audience figures, and it did pretty well on Twitter as well. Uh, in fact, the, yeah, the first episode, this one here, was the most tweeted about uh, natural history show we've ever seen. But what's really interesting about natural history I'm programs? I'm sorry, the most tweeted about what show? Natural history program. Oh, wow. Um, and what's interesting about natural history shows is the, the peaks in Twitter engagement kind of map to the iconic sequences uh, in the show itself. And Red B uh, were doing all the marketing around the Africa show, so they bought um, the information off us, which was delivered to them uh, in real time. They, uh, the live show went out on, well, it was not a live show, but the premiere went out on a Wednesday, and the repeat went out on a Sunday. On a Thursday, the repeat of the show, right? The repeat yeah. of the show. Uh, Red B took the data from the Twitter data from uh, the, sh the premiere of the show, and used the peaks of engagement on Twitter to cut the promo to advertise the repeat, which went out on Sunday. Uh, so that's really innovative uh, use of, the, of this kind of Twitter data, and it's stuff that we'd never really anticipated. Uh, I see the, there's uh, two spikes. One in particular, I think you were talking a little bit about that earlier when we were uh, getting ready to come on. Uh, what what animals were uh, were in that one peak? So that's the, if I zoom in on that, that's the giraffe fight, if I'm not mistaken. Anybody um, here seen giraffes fighting? It's pretty disturbing, actually. Yeah, it was good. It was pretty mad, the whole slow-mo stuff. Uh, and then, so you can zoom in on a particular peak to interrogate it and then see, like, the most influential tweets, you know, during that time. Um, so it's pretty powerful stuff. Uh, and kind of narrowing on that particular vertical, the broadcast vertical, is something that we've been focused on from day one. And it's kind of... Um, Reaping rewards. Now we're kind of doing really well in the UK uh, with the people we're signing up, and they're pulling really interesting stuff out of what we're producing to kind of really change the way they run their businesses. Uh, I was telling Andy that a few uh, few weeks ago, I was actually in New York talking to Time Warner, and um, this type of data has become absolutely critical for how TV companies are making their decisions, uh, which programs they play, which advertising, how they do promos. Um, and just to kind of repeat a little bit of what Andy just said, it was fascinating to me to see that um, TV companies can actually look at the single most compelling moment in a particular program, like the Africa program and Giraffes Fighting, and then actually cut that out and use that to promote uh, a repeat of the show or to, repeat or to promote other shows within that series. So really fascinating, but uh, absolutely a big strategic priority for Time Warner and other companies in the U.S. as well. This is just one last thing. Uh, so <laughs> films are really interesting. Like They tend to uh, repeat themselves, and, and the engagement patterns are almost identical every time the film goes out. This is the Liam Nielsen film, uh, Taken. Uh, and you can see that big spike there. Uh, <laughs> it, it always uh, crops up. Uh, and even uh, the littlest spikes kind of repeat themselves in a really predictable way. The big spike is the the famous I'll find you and I'll kill you speech, which is uh, you know, repeated by a predominantly male audience just saying those lines, if you see what I mean. Um, but, I mean, it's not just that. There's a Zac Efron film, um, 17 again, I think, and you can uh, reliably predict that uh, exactly 40 minutes into that film, Zac Efron will trend on Twitter in the UK, and it's the sequence where he's kind of coming out of a car and walking towards the camera, and a predominantly female audience is tweeting about how much they like Zac Efron. So, you, so looking at these patterns of behavior, you can start to predict uh, you know, what's going to be trending on Twitter, how to push stuff in front of an audience, that kind of stuff. So if I'm, for example, a uh, movie company and I'm looking at a global launch of uh, a movie and I'm looking at how I'm going to create commercials and some of these movies will spend 50 to $100 million on advertising uh, around the world, I could actually look at uh, trends like this and see where the audience gets the most excited and then use those moments to promote the movie. Exactly. Right? Awesome. Cool. Very cool. Awesome. Any questions, Randy? Okay. Awesome. Uh, so um, we're going to move on to our last company then, uh, Converse Social. Yep. Yeah, applause. And uh, give us a moment here.
so you're just going to probably go right back, so. Oh, so not, no, 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 it's totally fine. Uh, that's perfect, actually. So this is a quick overview of Conversocial, and I think he's actually just about to switch right back to his demo. But um, uh, how, we were talking earlier. How many people here, again, have used uh, social for customer service or to tweet at a brand? Positive or negative? Both? <laughs> yeah. OK, cool. So uh, go, go right ahead. Thanks, ahead. guys. So I'm Josh, uh, I'm the founder and CEO of Conversocial. Uh, we've been around for a few years now. Uh, we build social customer service software that helps companies deliver a great customer experience through places like Facebook and Twitter. Um, I'll, I'll flick through uh, to, yeah. there we go. And then just go into, uh, yeah, there you go, and just go into full screen. Yeah, I've got another window, I think. There you go. Cool. So we, um, companies use our software generally in their call center. Uh, so we have many customers like big retailers like Tesco, Waitrose, Marks and Spencer. Uh, and they'll have large teams of, of customer service agents who their full-time job is just responding to customers through social media channels. Um, and this is, you know, when we started, we were very much focused on what we call reactive customer service or social customer service. So people going to your Facebook page, to your Twitter account and, and writing direct questions. Uh, and that's increased phenomenally over the last few years. Uh, one of our customers... Uh, when we started working with them two years ago, had, uh, we're getting about 10,000 messages a month on Facebook and Twitter, uh, and now they're getting about 150,000 direct. Um, so you know, it's, it's growing phenomenally. Um, but the reactive customer service is only part of the puzzle. Uh, and actually, you know, for every person who's getting in touch with a company directly on, on someone like Twitter or Facebook, there's also a massive amount of people you know, tweeting about problems they're having without directly reaching out. Uh, we did a study um, last, just last fall with New York University where we examined uh, 24 hours of Twitter activity, um, actually using DataSift to pull out the data, uh, of everyone who was tweeting about uh, four major US retailers. Uh, and we found that only 3% of those were actually using the app mention to get in touch directly with the company, and the rest were just mentioning the name. Um, but out of the, this massive amount, uh, only around a third were kind of relevant to customer service, and actually only about 8% of that were really un unhappy customers. And so you've got this a, a massive amount of noise that's going on uh, that's far too much for, for any kind of customer service agent or team of agents to, to kind of sit through and look at every single one. I think, uh, actually, I was at a Gartner conference earlier, and I think they said, uh, you know, Walmart get something like 20, 25,000 mentions a day, Nike gets something like 100,000 a day, uh, and a lot of those just aren't relevant to go through and don't need a response. Um, and so we use DataSift to basically help help filter down that fire hose uh, and find the tweets that are relevant for our customers to actually respond to. Um, and so you, you can see here, this is just a quick demo we set up earlier, uh, going with a TV, TV theme uh, to find uh, people who are talking about Game of Thrones, um, but particularly uh, you know, not out mentioning them and not generally people who are writing review or selling stuff. So we've kind of filtered that out. And we wanted to find people who are speaking in English uh, and living in London. Uh, and so using DataSift, we were able to set up all, all of those kind of filters. Uh, and then we actually set up two different searches, uh, one for, for kind of general people under 5,000 followers, and one for you know, influence who've got more than 5,000 followers. So you've got these two separate streams. Uh, and it's very easy to set that up. And then that starts coming into Conversocial uh, in real time. Um, so DataSift gives us, you know, we can set up the most complex filters. We can change them on the fly. Uh, and instantly, that data starts coming into the system. Um, so once it's actually into the system, I think we've got a few from some big absolute radio and uh, some DJs and different things that came in here this morning. Um, once it's in the system, the first thing that Conversocial does is uh, try and intelligently discover if that's a customer service issue or not and prioritize that for you. So our system actually learns over time what you're responding to and what you're not responding to. And it, and it keeps getting better and better, and it uses that information to help prioritize the tweets that it thinks you're going to need to respond to and, and put the rest into the kind of normal inbox so that you can find and respond to the real customer service issues much quicker than otherwise. Um, we then provide a whole workflow that, so you can have large teams of agents, you know, 30, 40, 50 plus, working together to collaborate, have managers who are approving your responses, you know, assigning it to the right person, uh, and providing a, a conversation history with that customer that goes across uh, all public and private channels and multiple Twitter accounts. So if you had 
a customer who had tweeted at you on one Twitter handle, and then you'd had a conversation privately with them on another Twitter handle, and then they turned up in a search. We pull all of that together into a single conversation history to ensure you have a full view of everything that's going on uh, and can deliver the best possible service. Um, and then out the back of it, uh, we provide analytics around that, so, which are, again, are very customer service focused. So you can see you know, what's the average response time you're managing to get back to customers. Um, you can kind of break down the data of when they get, you know, what time of day they're getting in touch, uh, which is extremely useful for resourcing things like customer service. So, uh, uh, if I may interrupt, sure. so if I wanted a brand to actually respond to me, what's the best time of the day for me to tweet at them? Uh, it depends on the brand. Um, most customer service teams operate nine to five. Uh, it's actually a big issue because most social media users operate 7 p.m. to 11 p.m. <laughs> and Saturdays. Uh, and actually, one of the great things here is that you know, a lot of our customers, when we first started working with them, are really struggling to keep up with, with all, everything that's going on on social. And what was happening is you know, usually their agents would be coming in in the morning and they'd have this massive backlog of all of the things that was going, going on in the evening. Um, and not only is that an issue because it means they're taking ages to respond to people, it also makes them, puts them at massive risk of social media crisis. Um, so I think over the last decade, the, the biggest cause of social media crises has been people sharing and being exposed to poor experiences online. And uh, sharing it a lot. And sharing it yeah. a lot. And if most of that activity is happening at the evenings and weekends and you're not there, that's a real big issue. Um, so, so basically, customer service or operations are a lot of times are 9 to 5, but complaints are coming in on social 24-7. Yeah. And that I, sounds... And the great, but the great thing about social is that you can't ignore that. Yeah. So whereas it's easy to ignore that on phone and email, on social you can't because mm -hmm. it, it puts, such, puts your brand at risk. Uh, and so by actually just making it very easy to show that visually, um, a lot of our customers have now extended their, their social customer service hours into the evening and, and into the weekends. And some have actually gone fully 24-7. Wow. Yeah. So you guys, so Converse Social and its software and working with different clients have actually caused them to change how they're allocating customer service reps. Yeah, because they've That's had awesome. to. That's uh, awesome. And just you know, some, some real life examples of, of how this kind of thing's being used. Um, we actually work with uh, more than a third of all of the train operators in, in Britain. Um, and for a lot of these train operators, uh, they get a massive amount of tweets that, um, you know, ask about, about delays and issues. And it's something that they need to be able to respond to in real time. And if there's any kind of disruptions, they need to be able to know what's going on and, and start interacting in real time. And, and DataSift allows us to, to get that so we can access the full fire hose, filter it by location, filter it by different words, uh, and get that coming, coming in. So uh, Greater Anglia, for example, they actually have a, a mission control for their entire train operation in London, and their social customer service team is right in the middle of that, using Convo Social. Uh, and they're able to both feed data you know, out to customers instantly as soon as an issue comes up, and respond to customers instantly, but also actually they're using Twitter to, to get data from the customers who are on the trains and see what's happening and feed that into the rest of their mission control. And they actually have a daily report that, that co comes out of ConverSocial and goes out to more than 150 man train managers around the country because wow. of that. And for them, for all the train operators, being able to see, get this data within minutes is absolutely essential. Wow. Uh, what has been some of the most dramatic case studies? Obviously, you probably can't mention specific client names, but some of the craziest situations that you've seen in the last year or two. Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, obviously, when, when, whenever something explodes, social media goes crazy. Do you mean explodes literally or figuratively? Figuratively. Oh, okay. uh, yeah, I can't mention the exact yeah. client, but yeah, there was a, a major scandal with one of our customers recently. Uh, I'm not going to say anything. Can you give a little more detail? <laughs> Do you guys right. want to hear more detail? <laughs> there, there was a major issue, social media issue. Okay. It may have been spoken about on this stage not, okay. not, not that long ago. Uh, and actually, 91% of every single piece of communication their call center received throughout the scandal was coming through social media. Wow. Only 9% came through traditional channels like email, phone, letter. Uh, and that really shows you know, when something goes wrong, especially, you know, social media really goes crazy. And... and you know, having, having the teams and the tools and the processes to be able to deal with that effectively is, is absolutely essential. Have you found that there's certain demographics that tend to use social for customer service more than others? Uh, it's actually pretty broad. Wow. Um, I mean, there's a lot of data that shows, obviously, the younger you get, uh, the more the, the, they're likely to use social as a first port of call. Well, I think what we tend to find is that when social is used as a kind of last resort, it's kind of across the board. You know, people have tried to email, they've tried to phone, they haven't got the help they've needed and so they turn to social. But uh, also, there's just massively people are turning to social as the, the first thing when something goes wrong. 
you know, it's on their phone, uh, they're in store, they've got a problem, the car's broken down and they want to tweet at Hertz, you know, they'd rather tweet at them than, than email a phone. And certainly you know, what you see among younger demographics is that you know, social is just the primary communication channel over email, over anything else. And so when they have a question for a company, the natural place for them to go is, is, is social media. Yeah, we're finding that a lot in the U.S. as well. So at DataSift, uh, we actually work with a lot of companies. We also work with some city governments. And I think probably one of my favorite quotes from the last year was from a company that, or sorry, from a, a government official that said, um, you know, um, when a person that's say 45 sees a pothole in the street, the first thing that they'll do is, you know, call the city line and report it. If somebody who's let's say 20 or 25 sees a pothole in the street, the first thing they'll do is tweet about it. So, uh, and they said, you know, we're not going to change the behavior of millions of citizens. So, if we want to actually fully and totally support all voters and provide excellent customer service to everyone. We have to not just answer the phone when the voters call, but we also have to be on social and monitor when people are posting about things like uh, potholes, crime, muggings, restaurant inspections, et cetera. So it's just become yeah. an absolutely crucial uh, customer service channel, especially for younger demographics. Yeah, and that, that touches also that you know, some, a lot of companies are really not handling this very well because they're just trying to push people back to traditional channels. So if someone tweets at them with a problem, and they respond, oh, really sorry, can you phone us? Which is usually the worst, the last possible thing that person wants to hear and actually ends up generating lots of negative sentiment for them. So that makes people mad. It makes people mad. Yeah. And, it, and it's actually more expensive for a company to take a phone call than respond to a tweet as well. So that's actually it's an interesting nuts. point. Um, I've definitely seen stats around how expensive customer care calls can be. Yeah. Uh, so they're inefficient and they're also more expensive. So in a way, if you're being good as a brand at doing customer service on social, you might even be able to save money. Is that yeah? I mean, Gartner. I mean, we've got different bits of data. Gartner have kind of reviewed it, and they found that a social agent can handle four to eight times the amount of interactions per hour than a phone agent. Wow! Uh, so from a kind of call deflection point of view, it's actually massive savings. So if you can find people who've got a problem and help that problem before they've actually picked up the phone, then it's a massive opportunity to save money. So in other words, a brand could obviously work with Converse Social and still save money by pushing a lot of the activity from calls to social. Exactly. Wow. Yeah. So respond faster, 24-7, and save money. Sounds pretty good. That's a sales pitch. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Uh, very cool. So do we have any questions specifically for Converse Social? So um, wherever possible, we'll pull in what, what we can. Actually, something like DataSift provides, provides a lot of that on top as well. Um, but yeah, our, our core thing is being a customer service platform. So the more data we can get, the better. Um, but in the end, it's about responding to that customer and helping that customer. We're, we're not too concerned with just delivering kind of fancy reports on who's, who's saying what. Yeah, there's actually a, a huge number of ways that you can quote unquote clean the data. Uh, and actually drive more signal from it. And um, that's a big part of what DataSift does because you know, we want our customers like Converse Social to be able to focus on uh, the app and really adding value. So we will do things like uh, uh, cut out spam tweets, fake accounts, um, and we have a lot of other proprietary technology for quote unquote cleaning. Uh, one of the best ways we've found for actually identifying signal is by using things like a social authority as a filtering tool. So if you have a thousand tweets, you can actually map clout scores to all of the individual authors of those 1,000 tweets. Pick, for example, the let's call it the top 50 from the highest clout scores, triage those, probably respond to those first, um, and then kind of triage down. And you, know, you might just decide that anybody that has a clout score less than, let's call it five, is probably a fake account. Um, so it's funny because you know, people, you know, there's a quote once uh, that I heard, which is, uh, you, know, you always want to so, so democratic societies are not equal. If you vote, you're, you, know, you actually have more power than someone that doesn't. And it's the same thing with social. If uh, the more followers you have or the more friends you have on Facebook, frankly, the more powerful your voice is going to be. And I've talked to um, heads of customer service at credit card companies, hotel chains, uh, airlines. And the reality is, at least certainly what I've been told, is that not all social activity is created equal. Not all social users are created equal. And the more followers you have, the more activity you have, the higher your social influence. 
uh, the faster people are going to take care of you and do nice yeah. things for you. And our recommendation on that, uh, which, which most of our customers agree with, is that if someone's actually reaching out to you directly, so they're just out mentioning you or they're writing on your Facebook page, and it's a paying customer of a real problem, then you've got to respond and you've got to respond quickly. And it doesn't matter if they've got one follower, if they've got 100,000 followers or whatever. You know, it's a paying customer looking for help. Yeah. Um, when it comes to the proactive side of it, so someone's just tweeting about a problem they've got, you might not be able to reach out to everyone. And actually, people aren't expecting you to reach out. There may be lots of benefit for you to do that. And actually, when you're doing that, you need to choose selectively who you're going to reach out to. Uh, then it makes a massive difference to go, OK, well, we want to just focus on people who've got more than 10,000 followers or people who have a high clout score. And that's when that can really come into, come into effect. Interesting. Uh, so which companies, if, if you could think of one company in the UK that is doing an amazing job of using social for customer service, who would you suggest? Uh, Tesco are definitely the best. Um, that we've seen, and we've been working with them for about two years now. Um, they actually just got uh, voted the top company in the world at social customer service by um, the social 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 bakers, I think. Wow. Um, so, and you know, they've been just doing it longer than most people. I mean, there's lots of other companies to work with too who do an amazing job as well. But Tesco have been doing it longer than most people and have you know, serious investment from a high level to, to you know, really respond very quickly. They respond to almost everything within under half an hour and they'll resolve you know, every issue as publicly as possible in the same channel. They do proactive on, on Twitter as well and it's a pretty significant investment by them. It's really amazing what you can actually do on social. So uh, using the DataSift platform, we found that you can actually track thousands and thousands of conversations every day and by doing uh, tracking on sentiment, you can actually track how effective different brands are at uh, social and it actually making their customers happier. And it was kind of funny to find that, certainly in the US, there were companies that, uh, for the most part, were doing a great job. Uh, and then we found one or two brands who, will, who we will not name, who, um, on average, as they engaged people on social, people got more angry. Um, so uh, I think certainly it'd be good for that company to know that actually, even though they're spending money on social customer service, uh, they were actually making their customers more rather than less angry, which obviously has real financial impact. So we, we just have a few minutes uh, left, so wanted to open it up for maybe one or two last questions. I know it's kind of hot in here. Uh, Chris Smart, he's actually on the uh, board of DataSift, so. Um, Rob, the, the, the um, panel obviously and yourself are all up there, partly because of the interaction between their companies and DataSift. So I'm really interested in hearing um, the engagement So at, at a number of levels, which is if any of them would care to comment about um, the level of technology that they require in-house in order to uh, engage and use a data sift, and uh, you know, what else they would want um, from a data supplier like that. So. Great question. So do you guys, do you guys have a mic? So I have, we have, I think, at least one board member in the audience. So uh, this is your time to give us your wish list. <laughs> um, sure, I, I can start. Um, I mean, I mean in building a platform on top of uh, social media data um, is very challenging for lots of reasons. I mean, social, social platforms tend to adapt very, diff very quickly. They change what they do very quickly. Um, you know, the social APIs can break weekly sometimes. Um, you know, for us as a company, we have a lot of you know, very, very deep experience and knowledge on, on Facebook. We've been working with Facebook for a very long time. Um, you know, slightly less so with Twitter. And when it comes to, to the public Twitter data, you know, it's actually very expensive to get your own access to the fire hose, uh, being able to build um, very complex filters that, that can then get you that data from the fire hose in real time would actually require massive investment in, in infrastructure and technology, uh, you know, as you've heard of DataSift, that, that we just saw as really quite far out of our core competency. Um, and, and for us, I guess, what, what, data, what DataSift have done have kind of uh, democratized monitoring or commoditized monitoring uh, in, in a way that makes it very easy for us to just tap into that. Uh, and so it, you know, it saves a massive amount of hassle from our side because we tap in some very simple, very reliable APIs and can pull out very complicated data very quickly without having to worry about you know, all the other stuff that's going on or if the Twitter API is breaking or if they've got issues with their fire hose. Um, so for us, it, you know, it, it's great. Uh, and I think in, in terms of going forward, um, you know, we'd like to see more sources that we can, we can filter in that way, especially the kind of public 
public sources where you can you have vast amounts of data that need processing and filtering, which is you know, where we can get massive benefit from using data surfs. I guess for us at Face so, and then the platform that we develop, which is called Pulsar, the point is that um, monitoring has moved forward and you can do more complex things with data. So it's great for us that data as if does the baseline analytics and we can build intelligence on top of that. Because if we didn't have the baseline analytics, we would have to do all the kind of like heavy lifting ourselves and that would be really expensive and really slow in terms of development. So the partnership with DataSips allows us not only to do more complex things with data, such as understanding audience and building context around the social media data, but also move faster in terms of developing new innovations. And um, something that I kind of like wish for the future is to kind of like work more and more closely with data shift in terms of like syncing our roadmaps in terms of development so that we can kind of like innovate at an even faster pace than we're currently doing now. Uh, and then I think you guys have got a challenge on your hands, which is analyzing visual social media, uh, which is the big kind of like black hole of social media at the moment. And since like most interactions on social are getting visual, like Tumblr or like people posting pictures and visual memes, that is going to be the next frontier, I think, for, uh, uh, for innovation. Francesco, stay tuned, by the way. We have some interesting announcements on that in the next few months. Yeah, I, I, <coughs> excuse me. I, I agree with everything these two guys have said, but, and also add uh, the fact that DataSift provides historical access to the, the Twitter Firehose is, is invaluable for us. Um, and it allows us to do a couple of things. One is to jump back in time for customers and just you know, track shows which went out uh, all the way back to uh, January the 1st, uh, 2010. Uh, but it also allows us to implement uh, some of the kind of uh, more compl complex features that we've developed ourselves. So we've developed something called adaptive search, which allows us to monitor in real time uh, as tweets come in off the fire hose, what um, the micro trends and conversations which are happening around TV shows. So for example, on X Factor, we saw um, uh, last year, I think it was, we saw Gary Barlow turn around to, to one of the other judges and saying she had fag ash breath and hash fag ash breath trended within our, our system immediately and we added it as a search term. But the kind of the immediacy of the platform, the kind of speed that stuff comes out of it, means that we can, uh, you know, monitor things in real time and, you know, dynamically adapt to people's behaviour on Twitter in a way which we, you know, we wouldn't be able to uh, if Twitter if DataSiff wasn't around. Awesome. Well, we're pretty much out of time now. I think we have time for maybe one more question. I, yeah, I see your hand going up in the back. <clears throat> yes, hi. I've got a question primarily for Josh, but I'd be interested in anybody else's opinion on it as well on the panel. Um, first of all, from the customer service perspective, there's actually two questions. Um, do you see good social um, customer service becoming a sales differentiator in the way, for instance, some companies advertise onshore call centers? Um, and secondly, is there a way for the public to determine which companies are doing good social um, customer service. Sure. Well, I mean, in the end, you can go onto a company's Facebook page and pretty quickly see what the hell's going on. Um, and you know, it's actually one of our sales techniques is to email a CEO of a company with a little screenshot of uh, you know, their angry, uh, angry customer who's getting ignored publicly on their Facebook page. Um, we actually did a study, uh, again, with New York University, I think about a year ago, a year and a half ago, um, and one of the findings, it was a consumer survey, that almost 90% of people said they'd be less likely to buy from a company if they saw that they were just ignoring their customers on their Facebook page. And that's really the big thing about social, that it is completely public. You can you know, just search for a company on Twitter and instantly see all the tweets that people are making about them and, and whether they're getting a response or not. Um, so it, it, is, it is completely public and it, it's forcing companies to deliver a much better level of service than they have before because of that. Um, and it is becoming a real differentiator to your brand. Because if you're doing it well, then, you know, uh, again, another study we found it was that around, it, you know, if, you, if you deliver a great level of service on Twitter, around 50% of people, after getting the help that they've, they've, they've wanted, will publicly thank you uh, and, and publicly say about how good the service has been, um, which is, makes a massive difference from a brand perspective compared to the, the opposite, which is you don't do a good job and they retweet it and all their friends start sharing it and it creates man, you know, massive kind of negative brand damage. How many people here have uh, stopped using a brand or airline or hotel chain because they were terrible on customer service or social? Yeah. See, there you go, uh, impact right there. I think we're out of time. Uh, I want to thank uh, the three companies that are up on stage with me. 
We are working with uh, hundreds of companies around the world, I think in something like 30 countries. Uh, and the three companies that we have up on stage were very carefully curated and are definitely uh, three of the most innovative, cool companies doing really amazing stuff. So we're honored to be working with all of you guys, as well as having you guys up on stage today with us. Um, there's a data sit booth right outside if you guys have more questions uh, about the company. Uh, but want to thank all of you for uh, braving the heat uh, and joining us for this session today. Uh, thank you very much, and thanks to you guys. Thank you.